Junius Kambarage Nyerere was born on April 13, 1922 in Butiama, Tanganyika, to a local Zanaki chief called Nyerere Burito. At the age of 12, he began his education at the government primary school in Musoma, walking 26 miles each day to attend classes. He completed his schooling a year later. He was then transferred to Tabora Boys Government Secondary School in 1943 and later moved on to Makerere University in Uganda for a certificate in education. In 1949, he became the first Tanganyikan to study in Britain where he obtained a Master's of Arts in History and Economics at the University of Edinburgh. In 1954, he developed the Tanganyika African National Union which grouped together nationalist factions towards an agenda for independence and self-reliance for the country. Nyerere was forced by the colonial authorities to choose between his teaching career and his interest in political activities. He was reported as saying that he was a schoolmaster by choice and a politician by accident. In due course, he entered the Legislative Council in 1958 to become the Chief Minister in 1960. A year later, Tanganyika was granted internal self-government and Nyerere became Prime Minister. Nyerere's integrity, his ability as a political orator and organizer, and his readiness to work with different groupings was a significant factor to achieving independence without bloodshed. In this, he was helped by the cooperative attitude of the last British governor, Sir Richard Turnbull. God save the Queen would be replaced by God bless Africa. Tanganyika got full independence in December 1961 and a year later he was elected president of the republic in 1962. Head of state is a head of state. Uh, if, if you cough, people say that fellow is coughing and, and, uh, and then you are advised as head of a state and you are... During his political career, Nyerere grew to become one of the most respected and a leading figure in Africa through his messages of peace, unity, and his commitment to the liberation of the African people. He was instrumental in the creation of the Organization of African Unity and made his country the headquarters of the liberation movements in the continent. Nyerere believed in the gradual approach of the African unity through regional blocs. He was so determined to build the East African Federation that he offered to delay the independence of Tanganyika so that the three East African countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanganyika, would attain independence on the same day as a collective entity in order to unite under one government. Unfortunately, the leaders in the other two countries did not reciprocate his feelings. Nyerere never gave up. In 1964, he engineered the Union of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, the first such union of independent countries on the African continent, and he remained committed to the goal of African unity on a continental scale until his last days. The East Africa Community was founded in 1967 as an economic association of East African countries. It began with a declaration of intent between Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda to improve trade, communications, and economic development. Due to political differences and foreign interference, the community broke in 1977. However, a new East African community, which includes Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, was officially relaunched in 1999 in Tanzania's northern town of Arusha. A few years later, Burundi and Rwanda also joined. As president, Nyerere had to steer a difficult cause. By the late 1970s, Tanzania was one of the world's poorest countries. Like many others, it was suffering from a severe foreign debt, a decrease in foreign aid. 
The emerging of classes of the haves and the poor concerned him. Instead of leaders becoming servants, they developed an appetite for wealth. This led to Nyerere to come with a new policy to correct the growing gap. The Arusha Declaration 1967 was a blueprint for establishing a more egalitarian society which placed emphasis on self-reliance and avoided dependence upon foreign loans. The strategy entailed state ownership of major means of production and important services. Consequently, commercial banks, mills, commercial farms and leading import and export houses were nationalized. More importantly, he introduced the leadership code. Nyerere, who was fondly known as Mwalim, the teacher, argued that Tanzania had to move from being a nation of individual peasant producers, adopting the incentives and the ethics of the capitalist system. Instead, gradually building a nation of Ujamaa villages where the people would cooperate directly in small groups, which would further produce and equally share the benefits. We collectivized agriculture in Tanzania. We never did. There are a bunch of fools who keep saying, you know, you collectivized agriculture and that is why. We never did. And the Arusha Declaration states very clearly that if you are going to build socialism, it has to be voluntary. And we define a Ujamaa village, we say it's, it's a village where people live together, work together for the common good. They cannot live together, work together for the common good if, if you are going to force them. They, will not, they, won't, won't, they won't work together. So that is the first thing. We, we have not tried to force collectivization. Never. There was never a movement of forcing people to, to put their farm together and work together. So you have to persuade. And since you are persuading people, we envisage from the very beginning that it was going to take a long time. And it, it's a process, and it's a process. We can take you now to villages in Tanzania where there is complete collectivization, complete, voluntary and complete. And we can take you to areas, villages, most of them in Tanzania, where there is very little, very little collectivization. Most of the peasants are still working on their own farms. Fine, we have no problem. What we want is to help the, the peasant on his, his plot, to produce the maximum, and we realize beyond that, they will have to cooperate. They'll have to cooperate together. Julius Nyerere believed in the people-centered socialism. Humanness in its fullest sense, rather than wealth creation, must come first. Societies became better places through the development of people. The policy focus was on human development and self-reliance which brought some success in key areas, notably in health, education, and political identity. He believed that for long, the economy of Tanzania would depend on agriculture and animal husbandry as a means by which Tanzanians could live without depending on foreign assistance if they used their land properly. Land was a basis of human life, and all Tanzanians would use it as a valuable investment for future development. The government endeavored to see to it that it was being used for the benefit of the whole nation and not for the benefit of one individual or just a few people. It was the responsibility of the government and the cooperative societies to see to it that the people got the necessary tools, training and leadership in modern methods of agriculture. To implement the policy of self-reliance effectively, the people had to be taught the meaning of self-reliance in its practice to become self-sufficient in food, shelter, and reliable social services. Uh, so we built our leader, uh, deliberately we build up our leader, and he also becomes this symbol of the new order. This is a dilemma of this movement. Sometimes you build the leader to the extent that at, at the end, when you, have, you think you have become free, the fellow has become so powerful, you don't know what to do with him. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's inevitable. You don't know how you do it. Then apart from this, from the fact that we build this actually during the movement itself, the traditions are such that power is understood in our own countries in terms of individual, it used to be the chief, 
then it became the governor. Uh, colonialism didn't help us very much in building institutions. It's only now that we are trying to build institutions, to institutionalize government, to make, to make it collective. What is a cabinet to us? You talk traditionally uh, the idea of a cabinet government. Well, my university professors here understand it. But what is the idea of a cabinet government to the population here? By the mid-1970, the Tanzanian economy began to falter rapidly as a result of the rapid decline in exports and Tanzania's inability to import even the most basic commodities. Foreign aid decreased with IMF imposing conditionalities and the increased demand to repay loans. The economy was affected adversely by the oil shocks of the 1970 by drought and the war against the dictatorship of Idi Amin in Uganda also hit the economy of Tanzania. The IMF is no longer being used for the purposes for which it was founded. It was founded at the end of the First World War by the developed countries. Basically, frankly, by the United States and Britain. They are the founders, and until now, they are the controllers, quite frankly. They are the ones who have to decide what the organization is going to do. They, it was intended to be an instrument to avoid the economic problems that beset the developed world after this, in between the wars, after the First World War. That was their purpose. We were not there. India was not there. The so-called Third World was not there. That organized the Bretton Woods instruments were never intended for the Third World. They were intended to deal with the problems of the, third, of the First World. I think the difference between myself and, and some of my colleagues is that I say so. I'm saying so. The IMF, the conditions of the IMF as they are, they are very rough for the poor countries. And I'm saying that enough. Of late, there is a new condition. And this is of late. It's, n it's not in the charter of the IMF. It's a new conditionality. It's the whispers more than whispers. If you don't have an agreement with the IMF, we will not give you aid. This is terrible. The IMF, I'm saying, has now abandoned the purpose for which it was established. It was not a conspiracy. The way it is being used against us is not a conspiracy in the sense that it was founded to deal with our problems. It never was founded to deal with our problems. But in the course of time, it was discovered that it's very useful. It's a very good instrument of controlling the economies of the third world, of changing the policy, the direction of policies of the third world countries. It's a good instrument that can be used. And this is what is being used for now. It, it's an instrument of control. It's an instrument of destabilization of the third world. And, and so I say so, because it's a fact. This is what is happening. And I'm, I'm saying to Africa, please watch out. Watch out. See what, what has happened when a country has signed an agreement with IMF. You see what has happened. It's a problem. I'm not saying poor countries should not be asked to tighten their belt. They're tightening their belt all the time. My, I've just been saying, the people of Tanzania have been tightening up their belts all these last six years. But they go beyond that. Tighten more, tighten more. What is the purpose? It's never development, so that you may be able to pay the banks. It is tightening the belts for the purpose of private enterprise and the ability to pay the, to pay the banks. But I'm saying this is wrong. Mwalimu Nyerere was at the forefront of the most pressing issues for Africa at that time, the liberation struggle. He led the campaign to support the liberation struggle. Again, all these liberation movements based in Tanzania, including those from South Africa, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, establishing military camps for training for the freedom fighters in Tanzania.
Apart from the political fight in the international arena, Tanzania was also host to hundreds of thousands of refugees from many of these countries, including the ethnic-torn countries of Burundi and Rwanda. The assistance provided by Tanzania did not stop at giving refuge and the military training. Mwalim also worked hard to bring the various factions of the liberation movements together, even before total independence. In South Africa, apartheid had taken a tight grip. Anti-apartheid leaders, Nelson Mandela, among many more, were in prison. Those young leaders who emerged later, such as Steve Biko, were murdered. Tanzania led the struggle for dismantling of the apartheid and for the release of Nelson Mandela. The activist role of Nyerere played in advocating the welfare of Africans. He was invited to address the first post-apartheid parliament in South Africa after the regime was voted off by overwhelming votes. About Africa south of the Sahara. You are isolated from the centers of power. There, there is no internal problem, there is no internal urge in the United States or in Europe or in Japan to help Africa. None. And uh, I think to some extent the age of imperialism has gone. So you could easily be forgotten. <laughs> Africa, Africa is out of interest, of interest, when you have, when we are killing one another. We arouse a lot of interest. If we want to appear in, uh, in, uh, in European, uh, on European television, we can cause more trouble somewhere. <laughs> Africa south of the Sahara is isolated. Africa south of the Sahara, in, in the world of today, is on its own. Totally on its own. Nyerere, as a man of integrity, was always ready to accept mistakes both in policy and in practice. To friends, I can, I can admit, and we, we have made a number of mistakes. Um, I think one of them I spoke about yesterday. Only yesterday I was speaking one about about one of them. We we nationalized whatever industries we had. We have a have few industries in 60, around 67 when we became independent and around 67. One of the major and industrially we really did not have many industries to 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 nationalize. But we had a very highly developed SISO industry based on on um, estate. It was already beginning to run into some, some difficulty because of the world prices. The prices were going down. And, and we nationalized it. it. It was a mistake. It is quite clear it was a mistake. We did not have the management, the local management, to manage those farms. We, men, we, we nationalized some. some we, didn't, we didn't nationalize all the farms. We nationalized some estates and left others and this has proved the others which we left we, which we did not nationalize are doing much better than those we nationalized which we nationalized although of course they had to function in the same in the same uh, economic situation in the world and and the basic problem was that we simply did not have sufficient management the management was not was not uh, well well developed in this case, we made a mistake. That's one mistake. It's an, uh, one, one example of the type of mistake we made. I think also institutionally we made mistakes. We abolished the, the cooperative movement. I think we shouldn't have abolished the cooperative movement. Uh, once again, uh, centralization. We, again, it was a mistake. To, to, to centralize, you need a lot of ability to be able to centralize. And it's better to commit the mistake of of the people themselves with their little experience and continuously gaining their experience running small cooperative unions. It's better, better to commit the mistake there than to run the risk of centralization. When you run, the, when you make a mistake there, the mistake is, uh, is very serious. Mm -hmm. 
Julius Nyerere as Tanzania's president, philosopher king, shaped the country's policies and image to his own designs. Moving later in his career into a new role as international proponent of the Third World Corporation. But I go out, and sometimes, sometimes I get annoyed, but sometimes I don't get annoyed. Here I am, president of, former president of my country, no problem in Tanzania, we've never had these problems that they have. But I'm an African, and they see me, and they ask me the problems of Rwanda. I said, but I don't come from Rwanda. But you come from Africa. <laughs> What's that difference? <laughs> but I don't meet everybody. I don't meet an Englishman somewhere. Eh? If, if, if Blair was to come to Dar es Salaam, I don't ask him what is happening in, uh, in uh, Bosnia. <laughs> it, it never occurs to me. I should ask Blair, what is happening to you Europeans because of what is happening in the <laughs> if, if President Cole was to come somewhere, you know, I don't ask him, what is happening in Chechnya? Well, Cole, Cole could say, what, why are you asking me anything about Chechnya? I don't know what is happening in Chechnya. But this is not true about Africa. About Africa, Mr. President, you go, here you are, trying to build something which is a tremendous... Uh, tremendous uh, experience. But perhaps you are different, because sometimes they think South Africa is, is different. So perhaps they would say, oh, but this is President Mandela, this is different, you know, it's not... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the likes of me, no, I'm an African. <laughs> I say, sometimes I, I get irritated, but then I say, why? Why do I get irritated? Because, of course I'm a Tanzanian, but what is this Tanzania? What is this Tanzania? Why is it, see, is, should this European see me as a Tanzanian? What is this Tanzania? This is something we tried to create in my lifetime. I, 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 I built Tanzania. So what is this Tanzania? The Europeans are right. The North Americans are right to look at me as an African. As African countries became independent, several African leaders like Nyerere and Kwame Nkrumah joined the non-aligned movement. Originally, non-alignment simply meant not aligned with either of the military and ideological camps. If I go to Britain, I marvel at what has taken place. If I go to the United States, I'm overawed by, by the development there. If I go to China and see what they are doing, I say, ah, that we can also do. Ah, that we can also do. Because it's primitive. You go into their factory, it's a primitive factory, which has, uh, which has a roof, a leaking roof, and no cement floor, and they're producing glass there, they're producing other things. Which is, ah, that we can do, you know, at home. Hmm? And many things like that. If you, you go and you, you find the way they're organizing their communes, they are using tradition in order to break tradition. You see, we can do that in Africa too, you know? And, and, and many things, many, many things like that. Africa has experience. If we really Africa wants to be objective, uh, China has experience, which is very relevant to what is taking place in Africa at present. This is not a good thing to say, you know, with the others where, who see China as merely a threat and, uh, and not some country from which we can learn. And then there are others China is doing. He sometimes led campaigns for world peace and nuclear disarmament while allying himself closely with distinguished leaders like Pierre Trudeau of Canada, Olaf Palme of Sweden, Willy Brandt of Germany, and Teredi Allender of Denmark. Nyerere met Prime Minister of Canada Pierre Trudeau, Queen Elizabeth of Britain, Australian Prime Minister and US President John Kennedy on bilateral and multilateral cooperation. President of Tanganyika, President Nereri. I always associate the United States with freedom during those days when we were struggling for our freedom and having chosen the method of uh, peace to achieve our freedom, I used to come 
almost annually to the United Nations Organization to plead the cause of the freedom of my country. And every time I think of the United States, I think also of the freedom of my people. Nyerere stepped down as president and Ali Hassan Mwinyi took over the reins of power. Nevertheless, Nyerere continued to be an important political figure by retaining the position of chairperson of the ruling party Chama Chama Pinduzi, which had been formed in 1977 after the amalgamation of the Afro Shiraz party and Tano. The principles and values that Mwalim Nyerere stood for still arose deep interest within and between schools of thought a decade after his death. Nyerere humbly retired from active politics and moved back to his childhood home in the village of Utiama in western Tanzania. Of the many things this son of Africa will be remembered for was his humble, peace-loving, fight against corruption, crusade of justice, and non-believer in tribal or ethnic sentiments. Nyerere traveled more widely after retiring than he did when he was president of Tanzania. He was tasked to mediate the conflict in the countries of the Great Lakes, Rwanda and Burundi, and also DRC. He passed on the duty of mediating the Burundi peace crisis to Nelson Mandela, partly due to deteriorating health. He died in a London hospital of leukemia on October 14, 1999. Tanzanians and the world mourned the death of this great son of Africa. He was given a well-deserving send-off. Julius Nyerere has left a rich legacy still loved by his people and by many others all over.